Ah, response video. Yay, we finally have one of these these trash talkers. Um, has made a video. So this has a little Frankenstein haircut, coincidentally. I wonder if you'll deal with the Frankenstein thought experiment. Yeah, maybe we could provoke that out of him. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe we can cause that to happen. Anyway, um, yeah, so, yeah, here we go. This is, this is, this is the... This is what people use to justify their excessive, extreme rhetoric. So they will insult other people, and this is the kind of argument they'll use to defend that. I'll call that irresponsible, beyond anti, beyond natalling being foolish and idiotic. And I'll say those words, foolish, idiotic, ignorant. And I can demonstrate that the correlation between those words and the people who do natal. Um... And, and a selfish, um, excessively, extremely selfish, I'll even use those extra adjectives, um, this kind of philosophical fighting is cheating. It's a pussy going into the ring with a 9 millimeter and some brass knuckles and uh, some spikes on their toes to poke holes in the other guy's balls because they don't have an argument. All right, You're arguing like a little coward. That's what I'm going to call you, a coward. A coward resorts to this. If you don't have this stuff, fella, you don't get into the ring bold, big talking because somehow you're protected. You have the majority blanket to wrap yourself in. All right? And so you're going to use that as a cheat. And that's all you've done. Okay? You're a little, wimpy, insulting, trash-talking, crap-talking, um, waste of fucking uh, noise, uh, on the internet, and that's all you are. That's all you fucking are, is noise. Because you can't make a real argument. All right. You can't defend your uh, rhetoric. After watching the Magic Sandwich show deal with Mendham, and as well as, surprisingly, Zio Magad's Chris concerning antinatalism, I just... Yeah, well, why don't you quote her or quote me? Why don't you watch one of them, well, just one of my Ephelis videos as a channel. You know, it's life spelled backwards, pretty simple. Um, Ephelis. I had to make a little bit of a video concerning it. I already typed up a little bit of a script, but a little bit of backstory here. Uh, yeah, we probably don't need that. And you have to type up a script. Huh, lame. When it comes to antinatalism, uh, I don't like it. I don't respect it. Yeah, whatever. That's right. You don't respect it. You don't like it. You don't respect it. What you're not going to be able to say is that it's intellectually vacant or it doesn't, uh, isn't composed of a rational and reasonable um, premises. Because you're going to establish somehow that it's unreasonable to believe that suffering sucks. That it's unreasonable to believe that's the currency of uh, value. Uh, in the universe as we know it. You're basically arguing that that's an unreasonable presumption. And I think it's a silly position. Um, I even... I think you're rude and obnoxious and irresponsible. I think you're a menace to the human race because you're not going to make a reasoned argument defending that kind of nonsense. That's, that's just nonsense. It's not a silly argument, all right? It's one you can't deal with. That's a, there's a huge distinction between silly and what you can't deal with. And now you're just, you're, you're destroying the credibility even of your own atheism because your argument is as vacant to us as it is to those Christians. You're, 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 you're going to make the same qualifications they are. Well, yes, the Muslims are crazy, but Jesus is real. That's all you're going to do. I, I rarely try to actively argue against it because I feel antinatalists in general are very sure of their position. And if you are an antinatalist, I don't think that you're going to be convinced that you're wrong. Um, so, yeah, so, so that's, that's your cop-out, right? I mean, can't somebody just see that as a huge cop-out? So here you have a target that you claim is it's ridiculous philosophy. And yet you, you somehow don't have the balls to fight with it? You think you're going to convert most Christians? I don't think you are. Yet you're applauding people who spend their life devoted to this uh, um, agenda of arguing with Christians. So you're just revealing your hypocrisy. Somehow you see purpose in arguing with Christians, but you don't see purpose in arguing with antinatalists. So what's the distinction? Oh, I think the distinction is, is you're going to lose one argument. 
Um, I think that antinatalists in general have to reason themselves out of their position. There's nothing I can tell them to convince them they're wrong. Uh, okay, right. So you call something ridiculous that you can't, you can't even articulate it to the audience. You can't even explain to the audience what the brilliance is that you're going to put on the table that's just going to be so compelling that how could anybody, only a ridiculous person, could deny your logic wrong, all right? From my perspective, from my perspective, okay, you're as vacant as a religious idiot. You have no argument, you have no explanation beyond... I don't like it. Just like they say, I love God. I don't know why, I just do. And you're just saying, I don't like the idea of humans being called just biological, you know, nonsense that's sitting there eating its own ass. Well, too bad. I don't, I'm sorry you don't like it, but it's the fucking truth, asshole. Just like the Christians don't like the idea that it's the truth that their God doesn't exist. Well, yours doesn't exist either. Your fallacy that the human being is something other than a little carnage machine is just that, a fallacy. Because the position is based on opinion. Uh, yeah, well, right. Every um, uh, argument, everything's going to be based on some sort of premised opinion. Some sort of, some, some element of any argument is going to have to contain something made out of where you have to make a, a value judgment on the strength of the evidence. And some bits of it are going to be, you know, hard to, to sit there and say that probability. But I will, don't mind, I don't mind explaining it to you, asshole. I will explain it to you over and over and over and give you an opportunity to explain how I'm wrong. About every single premise in my argument, I will defend it. And I will explain how the evidence is pretty clear. That there's only, that there's a choice between a reasoned perception and an unreasonable perception. And you have to accept the reasonable one. And I'll go into that in a second. No, you won't. So within the purview of meta-ethics and normative ethics is a stance that's known as... Yeah, whatever. It's, it, it, you, you know, first you're going to sit there and... and, and um, I mean, this is like a, a grotesque misrepresentation of somebody. This is almost like a straw man when you start off even saying, first I'm going to put you in my categories of bullshit. All right? I'm not in your categories of bullshit. Fuck you and your meta-ethics. Fuck you and your, your whole conceptions, okay? We've already premised the argument. And now you're going to sit there and argue the premises. I mean, that's really pointless. I mean, why don't you just say, these people believe that suffering matters. These people believe that how sensate organisms feel is the value in the universe. And you don't believe that. So why don't you just explain that that's the premise here. You're an idiot and a moron who thinks suffering has no value. And uh, the people you're arguing uh, with are reasonable people who understand that the only thing they will spend money on are things that will give them gratification, satisf satisf you know, things like roofs, other things that give them comfort. That's what they spend their money on. Items of comfort. That comfort is the commodity. It is the thing that has value retard. Natalism. Put simply, antinatalism is the stance that it is unethical to bring forth new life into the world. Stop having babies because it's immoral. Or the very well, whatever. Th th that's, it, that isn't even the argument. The argument is, is there is no good reason, right? And the argument is, is that you, this, the, 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 the argument is, is that there's no, you can't justify the imposition. You can't justify the um, the the, no, the the exposure to risk. So it's just as unethical as doing any other experiment that has risk tied to it for no purpose. So if I build a nuclear power plant in my backyard because I on my whim and I do it sloppily and messily, um, yeah, I don't, my my neighbors have a right to complain. At least irresponsible. Traditionally, this view is um, something that. Uh, I, I wouldn't say stems directly from, but is is coined and championed by the philosopher David Benatar, who put forth the Benatarian asymmetry, which is generally conflated with what's known as the risk argument. No, it's not conflated with the risk argument, because this argument basically is there's nothing to gain, because there's no there's no emergency here. There's no damsel in distress. There's nothing the human race can 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 accomplish. There's no harm 
that can happen in this fail-safe position. There's none, and there's absolutely nothing until you create a need machine. There's no need in the world itself. The need always exists in the idiot, and without the idiot, there's no need to create human beings or to create life or to create anything. So there's no need to open the door to risk. It's only idiots like you that need to open the door to risk. That's it. <coughs> uh, the argument goes thusly. It is true that to bring a life into this world is to guarantee that it will suffer at some point in some way. It is not... I don't even care about that part of the argument, to tell you the truth. So that whether, it's a, whether that's guaranteed or not doesn't really matter. The argument is, is that if it's done over and over and over in regular permutations that yes there's no way to basically conform life unless you have some sort of you know absolute perfect control where you could eliminate the possibility of catastrophic failure Not true that to bring forth a life into this world is to guarantee that it will experience joy and happiness at some point and in some way Hence, if one is to accept the position that suffering is to be avoided, a hedonistic position, at all costs... Whatever. So it's hedonistic to... I mean, you know, c commonly the word hedonistic has been focused on desire. So you're saying that this is somehow connected to desire, which is not the argument. The argument is, it is not hedonistic to be um, harm-averse. Harm-averse is not the same as hedonistic, idiot. It is immoral to bring forth a life into this world. To add, the argument also states that it's impossible to totally get rid of human suffering without ending all human life as we know it. Since killing each other and genocide is only in addition to the suffering, we should focus on making our current lives as joyful and blissful as possible, while ensuring no further generations are to be submit to the suffering guaranteed in life. I personally find the antinatalist stance to be a ridiculous one, and then... Yeah, well, whatever. So you're going to call Benatar ridiculous. Anybody who believes it's ridiculous. So that's bold talk from a funny haircutted tubby man. I mean, you really have to do a little better than that, shithead. So if you're going to call somebody ridiculous, make a real argument. You're not going to do that, okay? You finding it ridiculous is kind of irrelevant when you don't have a counter-argument that's based on anything other than, well, we're going to show it what it's based on. Okay, straw. Tar's arguments tenuous at best. Here's a short response. Yeah, let's get the to badness it. of risking harming potential sentient beings depends on the so called vegetarian asymmetry, which in turn depends on a hedonistic and consequentialist idea of goodness. Let me say it again. Consequential, no, it's not consequential. It has to do with the fact that this is the the lowest, if reducing the value equations and all value equations, the commodity is this thing called discomfort. All right, it's in, it's intrinsically negative. No matter who experiences it, it's negative. Now there are special circumstances, circumstances where one amount of it can be endured because it prevents more of it. So, like when somebody jumps on a grenade in a war environment and saves his fellow war makers um, harm and suffering and pain. He has exposed himself to some pain to prevent more pain. So in that circumstance, the suffering you could argue, if you want to be convoluted, is good because it prevents more harm. So obviously one instance of harm can be a good thing because it prevents more harm. But you wouldn't call the harm itself, you wouldn't call the act of jumping on a grenade a good time. You wouldn't say, let's have a whole bunch of jumping on grenades because it's a good thing. All right? You'd obviously, you're incurring a negative fundamentally, and you're only making the negative valuable because you are preventing a bigger negative. I mean, come on. It's ridiculous that I have to explain that to you, okay? That's ridiculous. You're going to claim it's ridiculous to understand that it's fundamentally negative to jump on grenades. And on a substantive first-person metaphysic. I deny that hedonistic consequentialism is sufficient for goodness, and that persons, either real or potential, are basic, durable, and independent beings. Yeah, well, I don't know what that has to do with the subject, okay? So you're going to basically say something, what, silly? 
Uh, I mean, the law of thermodynamics is, a, is basically the rule, right? Now, in a little exceptional environments, thermodynamics isn't taking a place because it's a closed system. And, uh, but we know that in the end, it's going to get absorbed into the big picture. So the fact that the king does pretty well most of the time in the game of chess doesn't negate the fact that the rest of the players are getting the shit kicked out of them. Idiot. To clarify, the risking of harming potential sentient beings, that is, bringing forth new life into this world for them to suffer being a bad thing, is dependent on the normative position of consequentialism. Further... No, I mean, so, so what the hell is that? The normative position of consequentialism. So, so, so what, what is that? What, does that? what is that supposed to mean to somebody listening to this rubbish? I mean, exactly. What is that supposed to mean? That the, the basic rule doesn't apply somehow? That somehow what people feel isn't the definition of harm, good or evil, isn't dependent on the fact that people are capable of suffering? So torture isn't bad because people suffer during the torture. No, torture is bad because it has a T in it. I mean, fuck you. It advocates strongly the hedonistic idea that joy must be preferred at all. So, so you've said hedonistic three times now about people not defending desire, but defending pain and suffering. I mean, that just really doesn't make any sense. It's a defensive position. Hedonism is an aggressive position. So you can't even get that right. All times over suffering, and that suffering is to be avoided at all costs. Well, again, it's not to be avoided at all costs. Benatar would not say that soldiers shouldn't jump on grenades. All right? But, yeah, it's to be avoided when unnecessary. That's the argument. There's no necessity to open the door to harm to create an individual that is just basically a creator of need. There's no need to create need. There's no need to create need. There's no rational, logical reason to create the need machine that will need itself to exist. And then need its comfort, and need to be a consumer, and need to take the welfare of other things and absorb them. There's no need, there's no rational need to do it. I reject both consequentialism as a virtue ethicist as well as hedonism as being sufficient to define what could be considered good or preferable. Yeah, whatever. Those are your words. That's your paraphrase. What you have to do is reject the idea that uh, nature is fundamentally unintelligent design, um, unintelligent performance, unintelligent governance, um, an unintelligent mechanism. Uh, that is made out of crude forces. It is a crude battlefield in which this life is generated, a crude uh, petri dish that it's grown in. Um, and the fundamental structure of it is self-defeating, self-consuming, self-destructive, self... It's, it is entirely building its own reason um, to create the, um, the cost. It's just a friction machine. It doesn't create anything of real value. It just creates noise, friction, heat. All the negative things a machine can produce, it creates, it consumes something of value, which is suffering, and it produces nothing of real value except the amelioration of some of the negatives created by its own existence. And then it calls itself an accomplished human being. I mean, that's what an accomplished human being does. It goes into the world, creates a whole bunch of suffering, helps some old lady cross the street, says, I'm a great guy because I do so much good stuff. And it just ignores the fact that it harmed things just as valuable as the old lady a million other times on a million other days. And, and there's just no rational value equation here. It's all decidedly negative, and yet they'll sit there and raise their hand and say, I'm a great guy, I'm a positive, I'm productive. No, you're a fail. A preposterous fail. The position itself, being dependent on a first-person metaphysic, is, in essence, the pointing out that the position is based on an entire, or not an entirely normative argument, but one based on personal opinion. Well, right, the personal opinion that suffering sucks. Again, so I, we really have to do this. I have to go through my life explaining why the Holocaust was bad, and I first have to say, because suffering sucks.
So every every time every argument has to be premised with the agreement that oh yeah you know basically I can't have a coherent conversation on planet Earth if I, if if the presumption that suffering sucks is not going to be obeyed if you don't believe suffering sucks well then yeah I can't have a conversation with you all I can say is maybe run like hell because you scared the motherfucking shit out of me you fucking nihilist crazy fuck not only do I reject the notion that all suffering uh, is necessarily bad and to be avoided, but I also... Well, again, that isn't the argument, but certainly decidedly, decidedly, okay, um, in most circumstances, there's it's hugely wasteful and pointless. Most of the suffering we endure doesn't anymore have any constructive purpose. We already understand what a broken leg is. We understand that we have to walk on crutches. We don't need horrendous pain. We don't need pain while we're sleeping. We don't need all these other things that come with it because the biology is crude and stupid. So most of the suffering is completely superfluous and excessive and unnecessary. It's not precisely engineered, precisely placed. It's all excessive and and, and um, preposterously so. And again, if, if some percentage of women enjoyed being raped, would that justify rape then? So will you give me the number? What number, what percentage of women um, have to be at least benign or, or you know, benign on the subject of rape? Like, I don't care one way or the other. Just go ahead, go ahead and rape me if you want to. Um, or they enjoy it. What percentage would have to fall into that category for you to say rape is okay? Because that's the argument you're making here. You're basically just saying if anything, if, if in any circumstance suffering isn't bad because it prevents more suffering, that means uh, suffering's good. That's all you're saying. It's that, that preposterous. So go ahead. You tell me how many, how many women um, have to be benign on, on uh, a rape for you to say it's okay for men to rape women? Come on, have the balls to answer the question. To reject the notion of the consequences of an action that the consequences of an action, that is, causing a potential sentient being to suffer, define the necessary moral equation of the action as being either bad or good. I judge moral actions on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, right, which you can't do anyway. I mean, practically, there's just absolutely no... We can't even judge World War II, okay, in terms of knowing that it would be a good idea to go prevent it. I mean, if I had a time machine, I could stick a fork in Adolf Hitler's mother's eye at a dinner table. I mean, part of me knows it's got to be the right thing to do. But part of me has some appre apprehension because, yes, I'm radically changing uh, history. And maybe the whole dynamic of who gets the nuclear bomb first, maybe the Russians get it first, maybe something else happens. Everything changes because I changed this history. So maybe that isn't the right person to stick the fork in. Maybe there's some other fork going in some other eye that would be the right one to do, and I just can't know that because there's so many variables. But the very fact that we know that the war itself is bad, that we know the harm and the death and the mayhem and the little kids with their legs blown off, we know that's bad, asshole. It could very well be true that bringing a life into this world would cause it to suffer. However, there are other things to consider than simply that. <clears throat> well, whatever. You, you, want, you want to make value. You're taking value and saying it has some other level, okay? That the kernel of value is not the welfare of a sentient being in terms of its comfort, that somehow it's some other arbitrary thing that you're going to put up in the sky up there. It's God. It's Jesus. It's love of Jesus. Since it's is it true that the life could experience more joy than suffering? Is it true that the subject... Again, these are... The, the question is, is what you have a right to impose in the first place to risk, all right? Again, the, 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 the equation is a risk equation, and the fundamental point is, is that you have no reason to initiate it, no reason to open the door to risk, to create the need machine. Whether the need machine might successfully navigate the world... Um, is irrelevant because we know that over time and in proportion to the real world that we know what the end results are. So having the delusion that your kid is going to be um, rich, famous, and a celebrity and be in a million movies and all that stuff, that would be silly. It would be silly for somebody to have the expectation that their child is going to escape all of this horror that's in the world and have the perfect life. That would be a silly expectation. We know what the real world's made out of, asshole might find some salvation in the melancholy of suffering. Is it true that the parents of this child took this notion... Right, so so you could also say that, well, you know, it, it could be true that your child would be born retarded and won't know the, 
the difference, won't know any better. And so even though you wouldn't live that life, even though you wouldn't choose to live as a retard, you can just negate it by saying it's retarded, therefore it doesn't know any better, therefore the suffering it incurs is okay because it thinks it's okay. Because it can't tell that its life is crap. The suffering into account, yet decided to bring the life into being anyway, because of beliefs of being able to overcome such adversities. If any of these things are true, then the asymmetry and the risk argument themselves fall flat as an argument against... Right. So, again, so he's, if one, one single woman enjoys being raped, that means rape is okay. I mean, it's just a silly argument. Silly. Is having a child. Now, don't get me wrong. I do advocate that parents need to be more responsible in bringing forth babies. And right, right, right. So now I'm going to tell you what the right standard is. I'm going to tell you it's not fail safe, it's safety faily. It's right on this line right here. This is where the right line is. I mean, you know, not based on principle, just based on your irrational. I pulled it out of a hat of possible places to draw the line. Um, Benatar drew a rational line, you're going to draw an irrational line. You're basically just going to say, yeah, Muslims are wrong. I love Jeebus. I'm right. Lives in the world. Knowing that you cannot support a child <clears throat> and, ra to ra and raise them efficiently is a good reason to not have that child. Now, no, what else is a good reason? The fact that you can't undo it if it goes wrong. So if the child does suffer intensely, Okay, you can't undo it. If this child suffers intensely, says, fuck you, dad, I really don't appreciate it. I'd rather not have been, there's not a goddamn thing you can do to undo it. Not a mother fucking thing. So that sounds like a good reason to me, doesn't it? Hey, doesn't it sound like a good reason to you? My turtle over there probably thinks that's a pretty good reason right there. Because you had no reason to fucking open the door in the first place. You had no reason, no rational imperative to open the fucking door to the harm that individual will experience. And you have no way, no insurance policy in the world, no way to undo it. No way to fix it once it goes wrong. No fucking way. As there is some guarantee that the suffering the child will have will not be able to be overcome. Plus, there is no guarantee that the child would find some... So again, it's your fucking rationalizations about when somebody's life is worth living. And you're, again, not focusing on the fact that, well, you can't create victims. All right? That should be, like, the first rule. Okay? The first rule of being in, like, uh, you know, being, um, what was the name of that company, that uh, DuPont? The first rule of being in the chemistry business is, well, you don't put your plant over in some third world country and poison a thousand people and blow them up. Yeah, that's wrong. You put that in the wrong category. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah, that's the principle. And so the first principle here is until you have a solution for your inability to control this experiment, um, you really don't have a right to do the experiment, shithead. Because there's no imperative. There, are, there is no purgatory with a bunch of suffering Martians and Venetians and um, Uraniuses and Inzums. There's no, there's no purgatory where they're all existing, banging on the door. Please, let me out, let me out. That's not happening anywhere, asshole. That's not a rational description of reality. So there's no friggin' reason to open those doors. There's no reason to open the Martian door, or the Plutonian door, or the Venetian door. None of those doors need to be opened. Counter that argument, dumbass. Salvation and said suffering, while it is still a possibility. To summarize, I agree with the premise that... Yes, to summarize, you are a straw man making, um, asshole. Period. You're not arguing people's argument, you're arguing your perversion, your remixing, your, your distortion, um, and saying, there, I've accomplished the task. Well, no, you haven't, because you haven't answered the real questions being asked by the real antinatalists who are not hedonists, asshole. That a responsible notion should be taken into account when having children. 
And if this were the only trip... Right, right, right. And you're just going to tell us that my definition of responsible, which is, well, if there's a 50-50 chance she's going to like it because she's too drunk to know better, it's okay to rape her. Listen, I'm an antinatalist. You could even call me one. However, there is no... please. Yeah, please. No one do that, okay? Because we really don't need this kind of fucktard in our cult. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Efficient argument that could be made to categorize all baby making as objectively irresponsible or No, the argument is is that it's objectively unnecessary. That it exposes it opens the door to an unnecessary harm because it cannot possibly produce anything because the non existent are not banging on a door saying, Let me out. They're not in a negative place. Therefore, releasing them cannot be positive. Immoral. Antinatalism, in my opinion, is a joke. And in my opinion, you have a silly haircut and are a rotten arguer and uh, your rhetoric is... Um, yeah, your, your, your talk is bigger than your, your, your walk. You got no, you got no you know, balls to back up your bullshit. Oh, that's a good one. No balls to back up your bullshit. Asshole. (laughs) Yeah. So, that's what we get. We get a bunch of circular, convoluted, philosophical babble. You know, they start with the, 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 well, it's all that normative crap and all the rest of this, this, this jackass, um, perversion of simple arguments. I mean, either, you, like I said, it really isn't that complicated. I mean, if I, I, I and I, I really, I'm going to resist the, ne- this, the apparent necessity to preface every single conversation with the explanation that suffering is a, a value commodity in the world. That what makes the Holocaust bad is that people suffer. That that's what makes it bad. People suffer. It wouldn't be bad if they didn't suffer. 